Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin. This is Life, Liberty, and Levin with my good friend, Ken Starr. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you. You were a judge for a period of time. How long were you a judge? Six years. Did you like it? I loved it. Yeah? I didn't want to leave. You didn't want to leave? No. But you left. I was asked by the president through the attorney general. I knew President Bush 41, and Attorney General Thornburg said, we really need you to come on board. And so I said no twice, but the third time proved uh, to be fatal for me. But I, I love being Solicitor General, which is why I left the bench. I'm glad you're not a judge anymore. You'd be <clears throat> one of a thousand. We never hear from you again. But it's very important that you're available today to give commentary on what's taking place in Washington. Uh, you know, I study this, you've lived this as an independent counsel under the independent counsel statute, which was quite different. You had all these rules you had to follow as a matter of federal law. Uh, and then Congress came to its senses and said, uh, we don't like this anymore. <laughs> and they let it lapse. But let's talk about coming to our senses. What's going on mm -hmm. in the House of Representatives today has never taken place in American history. The manner in which the Intelligence Committee took over the investigation, the manner in which that investigation occurred, dumping it into the House Judiciary Committee that gets testimony from lawyers and, mm -hmm. and law professors. And now we have Nancy Pelosi, after this vote is taken, this one-sided vote is taken, who holds up the impeachment and says, you know, under the House rules, I don't have to appoint managers right now. And Professor Lawrence Tribe of Harvard has told her, hold it up so you can get mm -hmm. McConnell to do what they want him to do in the Senate. What do you make of all this? It is a lesson and a nasty lesson in how not to do uh, impeachment. It's an example of raw power being exercised and the Constitution vests sole power in the House of Representatives. She seized power that I think belong to the House of Representatives as a body, all 435 or 431, a few absentee folks these days. She sees power on September 24th. She unilaterally, without a debate in the House, and the House is supposed to be a deliberative body. That's really what the rules are designed to promote, orderly, procedurally sensible decision-making. She just said, here it is. So she uh, exercised a quasi-monarchical power and I think imperiously seized the power of the House and said, this is now an impeachment inquiry. Oh, yes, eventually there was a vote, but only after the die was already cast. Now the House Intelligence Committee, as you just said, with Adam Schiff, and what an enormously poor judgment in the choice of someone to essentially lead the impeachment inquiry. Instead of someone like Peter Rodino, a Democrat during Nixon, who was respected for his fairness, Henry Hyde, a Republican during Clinton, who was not simply respected, he was beloved on both sides of the aisle. Very conservative Republican, but he believed in our culture of liberty, as you well know. Instead of someone like that, of real dignity and stature, she chose someone who had led this extravagant, ill-founded theory of Russian collusion, which, by the way, was debunked by Robert Mueller. So at every step, including the most recent step, in saying, well, we're going to listen to Professor Tribe and we're going to hold this up. Now she is intruding into the power of the Senate. It is the Senate that has the sole power to try impeachments. And now she wants to, I gather, condition the sending of the articles over. She's done her work. Appoint the impeachment managers, and then they present or exhibit the articles before the world's greatest deliberative body, the Senate. She's trying to say, no, we're going to now engineer this in a way that does what? Is essentially, I believe, Mark, a concession that the record was inadequate. It was inadequate to indict, so to speak, and I believe it's woefully inadequate to convict and remove the president from office in the Senate. As I stand back and look at this and hear what you're saying, Nancy Pelosi has burned through the House tradition when it comes to impeachment, and not just the presidents of judges. We've never seen anything like this before in American history. She burns through any notion of due process. I'm not talking about criminal due process. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about 
you know, post Magna Carta type due process that right. people believe that people need a fair hearing. You should be able to confront your witnesses and that sort of thing. burns through that. Uh, they're in a race to get this done. Uh, we've never seen anything like this. And now she's reaching, as you point, into the Senate right. and saying, uh, now I have some control over what you're going to do over there. And if you dismiss this or you act quickly, I don't like that. So I'm holding back. I don't know if it were me. I'd like your input on this. If I'm Mitch McConnell and the Republicans, I have to defend the Constitution. I have to defend my institution from the poison that's pouring into my institution from the House of Representatives and the Democrats. She can't cripple a president and blackmail a Senate at the same time. I'd be curious. I think that Mitch McConnell should do something akin to saying, you know what? You're not sending it here. It's null and void. Mm. You're not sending it here. We don't recognize it because you're not finishing the process. We're part of the process. Something like that, do you think? Yeah, I like your null and void, but in essence, it, there's nothing for us to do. Uh, you cannot, just as we cannot, as a Senate, impose conditions on what you did. We did not say, before you exhibit any articles over here, you must take the following steps. You must call Ambassador Bolton, or you must call Hunter Biden. We didn't do that. We didn't interfere with you. We call the word, I love the word, comity. Sounds like comedy. C-O-M-I-T-Y, comedy between the branches. And she is violating, if she persists, that basic unwritten rule of comedy by essentially saying, hey, this is a holdup. This is a stick up. She has no authority to do it. And I'm really quite surprised, I really am, that uh, Professor Tribe said this is a, a serious possibility and apparently uh, the Democrats, I know there were some 30 Democrats who were urging her to do this before the vote uh, was even taken on impeachment. Let's start saying you need to have the following witnesses there. I just, uh, to me, again, it's un Unthinkably and unpardonably intrusive. It's yet another, Mark, abuse of power or an attempted abuse of power. Now let's talk about these articles. Abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. A few short answers, if you will, and then we'll get to the bigger point. Obstruction of Congress, really? Are we talking about the entire Congress? Or are we talking about the Democrats in the House of Representatives? <laughs> Senate is part of the Congress. So it's not even technically accurate to say obstruction of Congress. That said, when a president challenges a subpoena for a witness or documents, a former judge, and he goes to court to work out this complex dispute, separation of powers between Article I and Article II, and they go to an Article III court, how can that be obstruction of justice? or obstruction of Congress. It certainly is not obstruction of justice because uh, the president was essentially saying let's go to the Article 3 branch. That is our system and we all know that. They have chosen, the House majority has chosen, well that's going to take too long and we're in, a, we're in a hurry. So I don't think at all that anyone is seriously suggesting it's an obstruction of justice other than r rhetoric. But it shouldn't be viewed as an obstruction of Congress either, unless Congress just has, again, unchecked power and a system that's so rich with checks and balances as we learn in school. Okay, we have a disagreement here. And what's the disagreement? You want the testimony of the closest advisors to the president. And as a matter of constitutional law, the president has the right to protect those conversations the Why? confidentially. Why is that important? It is important as the Supreme Court of the United States recognized in Richard Nixon's case and recognized it unanimously in order for the president to carry on the Article II function of serving as our chief magistrate. He has to be able to have the advice and the confidence of those around him, just as a judge has to be able to depend on his or her law clerks. And for that conversation between the judge and a law clerk, or between Nancy Pelosi and her 
general counsel. That has to remain confidential in order for there to be a full advice. We're saying this is our best judgment, Mr. President. The president gets to protect those, presumptively. can be overcome, but that's why judges and uh, the Article Three branch sets. Now, this isn't new. It's not a secret. Separation of powers, executive privilege, conflicts between the branches. It's gone on with Democrats and Republicans. It's gone on when the Republicans control the Congress and the Democrats control the Congress and so forth and so on. If I may, it's yeah. gone on since George Washington. Since George Washington. George Washington That's invoked right. ex what we call executive privilege. So to, to raise it to the level of an impeachable offense, and if they get away with that, where does that leave the country? Where does that leave these branches of government and all powerful House of Representatives, which the framers feared? And a weakened president? This is gravely concerning from a constitutional perspective, is it not? We used to talk about the imperial presidency, but now we can talk about the imperial and imperious House of Representatives. So this is a chapter in our history. It's already proving to be a very ugly chapter in our constitutional history. And so I hope that cooler heads in the future will prevail and that people will return to what I would call constitutional order. You mentioned the Magna Carta, not in some judicial sense. What we call it is fundamental fairness. Are you proceeding in a way that a fair-minded person who doesn't have a stake in the specific action can say, yeah, that was fair. That was fair. And I think those norms have been violated as well. So I think since September 24th, we've had a very ugly anti-constitutional, some would say unconstitutional, certainly as Robert Pork would say, an anti-constitutional exercise in power by the House of Representatives and specifically by Speaker Pelosi. My question to you when we return is if we have an anti-constitutional or unconstitutional act by the majority in the House, pushing the result of an impeachment. Apart from what Nancy Pelosi's pulling now, what is the obligation of the United States Senate in response to that? Does the Constitution compel them to hold a trial? Does the Constitution say what kind of trial it must be? When we return, I'd like your input on that.